Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, special edition uh, of our show. We're, de we're delighted as we we've been prominently featuring the A-team of recently of late and we're We've spoken to an awful lot of uh, bad guys who have appeared on the A-team, but now we thought it'd be a good perspective to change it up and speak to one of the good guys. Uh, one of this guy was a, a, a character in season five. He played a recurring role for the entire episode. We spoke to him a few years ago. He was such a great guest, we decided to get him back again. The one and only Eddie Velez, who played the role of Frankie Santana in the A-Team. Uh, Eddie, it's a pleasure talking to you again, mate. Thank you. It's great to see you again. Speak to you. Uh, um, Eddie, I suppose um, the A-Team, uh, since we last sort of spoke, um, in terms of being shown constantly on TV, in terms of nearly every network all over the world, does a day go by or a month go by or a, a year go by that someone doesn't bring it up or you don't constantly hear the A team? Even in 2020, with the year that we've had, has someone ever mentioned the A team to you mm -hmm. so far this year? Well, that's funny. Uh, it, at the beginning of last year, I had a job that. Uh, uh, that I, I worked on uh, and and met one of my fans. It was it was funny because when I first took the job, one of the reasons I thought it would be a good idea was I, I knew that there were a lot of young fans that would grow up with the show, and I thought that'd be nice. And uh, sure enough, years later, decades later, I uh, I worked with an actor who, when he was younger, he he was one of my fans, and now here we are working together. You know, I know what that's like because I, I I came across. Uh, a lot of actors who I grew up watching as a kid, and that was always the biggest kick. They didn't have to be the biggest stars, but they were just, you know, they were a big factor in my, my youth and my growing up and my television uh, watching. And I just have great memories of uh, people like uh, when Robert Vaughn, for instance, mm -hmm. when he came on the show, he was just, I was a, a huge fan of his. I grew up watching Man from Uncle. Yeah. Right? So uh, I couldn't believe it, you know I mean? Here, it was like, in an instant, one moment I'm a kid watching Man From U.N.C.L.E. and in the blink of an eye, I'm, I'm on the set with the Man From U.N.C.L.E. and we're on, uh, I remember we were on opposite sides of a door mm. about to burst in with guns. It was just like a scene out of the Man From U.N.C.L.E. and it was like, I was transported. It was just wonderful, you know? Moments like that, those are the things that, that stick with you. And uh, Eddie, one thing that I didn't touch with you the last time, and I suppose it, I meant to, well, looking back on our discussion, I meant to talk to you about it, was uh, the relationships that you built up on the show in season five. I know you were there for one season, but uh, in terms of uh, striking up a camaraderie with Dirk Benedict and uh, Dwight Schultz, uh, are they still good friends of yours to this day? Do you, uh, when was the last time you spoke to them? Do you keep in touch at all? Or... Uh, in terms of, I was very much uh, gone your separate ways. Yeah, I guess uh, you could say we've gone, gone our separate ways. I haven't seen them since the show. Okay, wow. Uh, we didn't uh, connect that way. You know, we didn't socialize afterwards or anything. Uh, um, Mr. T, you know, he was wonderful. He was a lot of fun to work with and and uh, and act with and being. A lot of fun scenes, uh, action scenes, mm -hmm. um, but he, um, um, it was just a, uh, it was just a wonderful time. I didn't, uh, you know, there was a moment. I, you know, I, I, I hesitate to talk about it. I don't like to talk about anything negative, but there was a time where uh, there was a moment on the set mm -hmm. where uh, Dirk and Dwight, they were always together. They're like, you know, like yeah. Heckle and Jekyll when they were together. I had a wonderful time individually, but when they were together, they kind of, I, I noticed they would complain a lot about the, about the show, the state of the show. We knew, I knew that it was the last season of the show. They would, it was, you know, the, the ratings had gone down and they were trying to keep it alive for one more season. But they, um, there was one moment on the set where I was sitting, uh, I was, they, they, were, uh, they were complaining about the changes to the show mm -hmm. that season. And I was one of the changes and I was sitting right behind them on the set, you know, on one of the director's chairs. And 
that was disappointing, but I just had to let it go because I was there to do a job mm. and my character was supposed to be very happy to be there. So, so that's, uh, I was going to be very happy to be there myself. And, uh, and I had a wonderful time. That was the only instance where I thought, oh, that's too bad. And I suppose that, uh, Eddie, in terms of the A team and, and appearing on us, uh, one thing that uh, st struck me as well going through that, in terms of being on a network TV show that is in its height of its popularity, it's been shown all over the United States as well. In the aftermath, when it did finish up, did it strike opportunities for you in the next year or two? Did you Having that on your resume, did it open up doors for you? Uh, it, I don't know if it opened up doors. It didn't shut any doors down. You know, I, I, I went on working right after that, no problem. Uh, in fact, I got a job because my when I finished the A-team, my hair was so long, you know, I had it in a ponytail. It's when I started the show, it was a short point until by the end, it was pretty long. And I just let my hair out and uh, I went to an audition. I just decided I'm not going to cut it until I have a reason to cut it. And the next audition I had was to play this, a gigolo on, on Hill Street Blues. Okay. <laughs> so this long flowing hair was just Very different for the A team, Eddie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was very different. That's that's what's great about the show. You know, you just never know what kind of character or who you're going to be working with. It's just it's always a, an adventure, exciting. Yeah, um, Eddie. Um, one thing as well, we were doing the Bad Guys uh, documentary of the A Team, and we spoke to Tony Brubaker, and Tony Brubaker has played the stunt double for B. A. Baracus. And I was just sort of wondering in season sort of five, mm -hmm. did you have, I know the A-team and Stephen Cannell in particular, they were very precise in getting their stunt doubles to resemble the actual actors. And uh, what was, did you have a stunt double in season five? Was he very close to you? And uh, what was he, what was his name? And uh, was he brought in for the season to work with you? Yes, I did have a stunt double. His name was uh, Richard Duran. Okay. Uh, he was great. He was great. He was just, uh, and uh, he had been in the business a, a long time. And in fact, his father had been in the business uh, as an actor stuntman as well for many years before. Uh, he, in fact, I mean, I, you know, now you have IMDb so I can look people up and I looked him up and uh, he had done a ton of movies with uh, Marlon Brando. And I didn't know anything, anything about this uh, when I worked with Richard Brand. You know, he's just we didn't have all that information back then. But uh, but it was great. He was lovely, lovely man. He um, he would do my stunts in the beginning. I I, I like doing stunts myself, so I I would volunteer to do them. They would want me to do them. But uh, but once I learned that the the stunt man they get paid per stunt. So if you know if I did the stunt he did that he was there to do. Uh, he wouldn't get paid. So, so I started to just uh, let him do his job. I did my job and uh, let him uh, come in and, and, and do what he had to do, which he, he was great. He made me look good. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose, Eddie, one thing uh, in terms of the stunt, but he did, uh, from what I'm speaking to Tony, was in terms of those um, shootouts, in terms of shooting the blanks and in terms of uh, the gun sort of scenes, you did sort of participate in those sort of sort of shoot them up sort of scenes. The actress did. Was that yes. true? Yes, I mean it's, we had a lot of sh uh, you know shoot, shooting scenes. Uh, we had a lot of explosions, mm. uh, but it was all very safe. Uh, I was very. Uh, uh, I would work very closely with the uh, special effects man especially because I was playing, my character was a special effects expert. So I was always hanging out in the special effects department, trying to pick up some things about, you know, how they did the things for our show. So uh, his name was Al Desaro, the special effects expert on the show. And he was really helpful for, you know, for me to develop my character. And uh, Eddie, one thing as well, I suppose, I look back at the audio content and, uh, when you came in in season five, and I suppose this thing I didn't mention before, did you sit down with Stephen Cannell and did Stephen have a vision in terms of what he saw for Frankie Santana and how he started to fit in? Because obviously, D 
the A team were a commando unit and obviously were in sort of Vietnam, so and that was their sort of backstory. Obviously, you were you were never in sort of Vietnam in terms of your sort of character. So obviously, they had to, to try and develop a backstory about uh, Frankie Santana. So how did he try and sell that sort of backstory about the character and how he would sort of fit into this sort of renegade sort of army group? You know, he didn't, uh, they never uh, really directed me in a, in a direction. Okay. You know, once I, I showed up to audition, I did it the way I thought I should do it. I even showed up dressed basically the way I am dressed on the show. I came up with the black vest and I put my hair in a ponytail. I just went, tried to come up with some kind of character that was distinct because I, I noticed that everybody on the show has a very distinct character. So I thought I come up with some kind of look and something. And, and I knew about the tongue in cheek uh, style of the show. So I just, I showed up with my interpretation. I knew they were already interested in me because I had, I had been doing a, a movie in, uh, in uh, Montreal, Canada for NBC. And uh, I was playing a, a, an assassin, okay. terrorist type character. And they were sending the footage back to NBC from Montreal, and so they saw it. The the uh, Stephen Canal and and uh, the other co-executive producer John Ashley, they saw the footage and uh, liked what they saw. They invited me to come in and and meet with them, mm. and uh, and I did. And then I auditioned, and they never <clears throat> they never you know told me do it this way, do it that way. I just did what I thought, and I I assumed they liked it because they never told me to stop. So you know. And uh, I, my whole, whole attitude when I went in was to, was to play the character as if, uh, because it was, it was clear that he loved the A-team. He loved the idea of running around with them, being with them and uh, chasing bad guys with them. And uh, so that I, you know, I had a, I played it that way. I just, I showed up in a good mood every day to, to have fun. And uh, Eddie, in terms of season five, uh, people like your role. Personally, I do like your role in season five, but they sort of went out in the sort of the Robert Vaughan sort of trend that they brought in. Robert's a, a great actor, but they sort of went, A-Team was renowned as the Robin Hood of the society where these guys would yeah. help the, the local people, the local people with the local problems uh, in the sort of villages, the sort of, people who couldn't pay corrupt mortgage, corrupt bankers, corrupt uh, farmers and sort of livestock, that sort of cup, I'll make a buzzy. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden the A-team is sort of trust into James Bond type secret sort of mission sort of yes. stuff like that. A sort of a spy renegade sort of, sort of thing. Do you think that maybe that sort of took an essence away from the A-team, that sort of Robin Hood sort of feeling that they did from the four seasons. It was very much going from these guys driving all around America, stopping in villages, helping people with their sort of local problems to now being cast right. out into international sort of disputes. Right. Yeah, I'm sure it did change the the whole feel of the show for the fans. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some went with it. Some probably, you know, didn't. Uh, I can understand that. You're used to, a, a, you know, the, a, a story, a, a show being a certain way, and then they switch it up on you. But, uh, you know, I, I had never really watched many of the, the shows beforehand. So I learned about, about what kind of show it was after I got the job. Uh, and I understood that, yeah, it was more locally, you know, oriented. They would go into these small towns and, and help the little guys, say, you know, help somebody out that was being, uh, uh, you know, harassed by somebody. Mm. But, uh, but this, the, the fifth season, it became international. We were all over the world. We were supposedly in China and then like being in Eastern Europe and all over the place. Tongan Island. So for me, it was just well. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, in fact, you know, I had there was a, an Irish uh, director that we had who uh, I never forgot. He was great, Michael O'Hurley. He, you ever hear of him? Hurley, that's a Cork name. I know it's a, a Cork sounding name. 
uh, Michael O'Hurley. He, he was from Dublin, and uh, he, he directed about, about three or four of the episodes that year. I loved working with him. He was great. He was really talented. He did a lot of great projects afterwards, but I especially liked is that he worked fast, and I appreciated that, you know, because then you know if he's, you know, you, you're on your toes, you know, he'll print that first take, if, you know, and move on. So you got, you want to get it right. And uh, he would he would work fast. We'd be out of there by five o'clock, and on the very last shot every day, they they would bring him out a tumbler of scotch for his last shot of the day. And he would hold it and call the action and cut and that would be it. Yeah, and, and I suppose that- I knew when he had that drink, I would get home, going home. And uh, Eddie, in terms of um, the A-team and uh, sort of season five and sort of uh, that whole sort of experience, um, for you, in terms of being cast into the limelight and such a appearing in a sort of uh, national show, uh, as national sort of show, the character of Frankie Santana, was there often a time maybe for a year after where you'd be, say, if you went in holidays or you went in a job in New York and you're walking around Madison Square Garden or walking somewhere in Chicago or Los Angeles and people would stop up and say, hey, are you Frankie Santana? And people would call you Frankie Santana instead of your real name, Eddie, v Eddie Velez. Yes, it has happened. <laughs> it has happened. Uh, it's funny. What's funny is that when I see that look in their face where they, they, they know they know me from somewhere, sometimes they can't figure it out. They think they, maybe they went to school with me. They, you, know, they, you know, I work near where they work. There's a familiarity. There's something. And I can always see see that face, <laughs> and I know what's going on. And eventually, if you know, if they're curious enough, I'll let them know I'm an actor, and that's probably why. And I suppose Eddie, I was speaking to some of the guest actors in our Bad Guys documentary, as I was saying, and some of them tell me when their episodes uh, appear all over the world and and dubbed in different languages. I know it's 35, 40 years on. They keep see, getting residuals in the post. And uh, I imagine because you appeared in uh, multiple episodes in sort of season five, uh, you, you probably get residuals from all over the world, even to this day in terms of the A-team. And you're probably looking at it and say, there's more A-team posts today. Yeah, no, I, it does. They do come in from all over the world. It's amazing. I, you know, I, I love it. I love uh that's the way it worked out. <laughs> Residuals are a good thing. Um, uh, there was something at the beginning of your question. I, I can. What was it? Uh, um, Eddie, in in terms the of the A team, had? sort of uh, being uh, shown all over the world, in terms of being dubbed in so many okay. different languages as well. Um, how does that sort of? Uh, oh. You obviously can speak. Uh, I sp I presume you can speak Spanish. Can you or? So um, in I terms can, of a, but not good enough, not well enough. Yeah. Not well enough to be a, yeah, a translator. Yeah. But so, uh, you know, there was a, a yep. really, there, there was a really nice surprise that occurred uh, when, in 1988, which was uh, two years after we shot it. I happened to go to Puerto Rico. Okay. For vacation, I have a lot of family there, and I went there. And I had no idea that the A team had been dubbed and was showing in Puerto Rico. Okay. And it was the number two show on the island. It was called Los Magnificos, <laughs> the Magnificence they changed. So, but I had no idea. I showed up at the airport and people were like noticing me and coming to me and wanted, it was wanting order. I didn't know what was going on. Or so. <laughs> I had never really You thought you were coming for the premiere. Famous. <laughs> they did. And I wound up being interviewed by the newspapers and going on the local TV shows. They wanted to meet the, the new member of the A-team. It was amazing. I, w I went there for vacation, but I wound up exhausted by the time I left because it was just, I went on the, in the, the town parade with the, my, my, my family's uh, town mayor, you know, in a car and waving at the people. It was just wonderful. It was just, what a surprise. I had no idea that that, that was happening. And I suppose, Eddie, I saw something, I was going back three, 
I see, I mentioned it was going back seven or eight years now. I say even more. Channel 4 in England did it, did, did, did a documentary bringing back the A team. Uh, an actor there went to Los Angeles and he was sort of rounding up, trying to round up the A team stars for a sort of, a sort of get together. Were you ever approached for that? No, no, I haven't. I, oh. I, you know, I always, well, I would have loved to. Uh, but that never happened. I would have loved to have been in the, you know, do a cameo in the, the 18 movie. That would have been slick, but, you know. And, Eddie, in terms, in terms of the 18 movie as well, um, obviously you were very much centred in terms of the 18. You were on the set for the actual TV sort of show. Did you think what they did with the movie, making it Afghanistan, making it that sort of, that sort of trying to modernize what it was a winning concept. Did you think that it sort of took away from what the A team was really? Were you a bit disappointed with the movie or did you enjoy it? Uh, <clears throat> I enjoyed it. I mean, it was, a, it was a very, you know, high budget action picture. So all of that stuff looked great. Uh, you know, I, I, Mr. Uh, Mr. T is is B. A. Brock is to me <laughs> forever, and so and Mr. P and George Papard is hmm. is Hannibal Smith. You know, yeah, Liam Neeson struggled to I, pull off the yeah. comedy of George Papard, and uh, that's for sure. Yeah, George Papard is great with the comedy; he was wonderful. Yeah. And uh, Eddie, just sort of, I know everyone's uh, moving on sort of with time now and those sort of memories are beginning to fade. But do you ever like uh, in time, just when you have a quiet day, maybe start to close your eyes and maybe look back and go back to when you were on the set of uh, DA team and sort of such? And do you still have those sort of vivid memories uh of special times, special stories that you can tell family and loved ones and relations, relations, or are you finding with time now those are beginning to disappear? They are. It's amazing uh, because you called. I, <laughs> I, I've been. Uh, I watched a little bit of the A Team. You know, I said, let me watch the show. It's been so long, and uh, it's amazing that it's. it's uh, so many times I, it feels like I'm watching it for the first time. Mm -hmm. There's so many scenes that I'm in that I did that I, when I watch it, I don't remember doing them. Okay. It's weird. So it's a weird sensation. It's like, I, well, I obviously did the scene. I remember there I am. And, but I don't even remember, I have no memory of actually shooting that moment. And so it's, it's filed, you know, so try to uh, jog the memory. But I, I, you know, I do get some things come back to me. Like I remember one time I was, I had to drive a motorcycle. I had to ride one, mm. but I didn't, I had never ridden one. So they, they took me to the side, you know, a, a parking lot and taught me really quickly how to ride this motorcycle. Mm. And uh, it was great. So we go to do the shot and all I had to do is we pull up in the 18 van Everybody jumps out, they go their way. I jump onto a, 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 a motorcycle and I take off. Mm. And that's what I did. I jumped on the motorcycle and I revved it, but it was, I did it too hard that I popped the wheelie. Okay. And I was headed right for the camera. And at the last second, I muscled it over. It just scooted past the camera. And if you see the, sh the shot in the show, it looks brilliant. It's beautiful. It looks like, you know, it's amazing. Yet, I was completely out of control. <laughs> I, was, I was about to take out that camera, but uh, luckily it worked out great. It looks beautiful. You wouldn't know. <laughs> and I suppose- it Looks not like I meant to pop a wheelie. You know? <laughs> I suppose you are one of the few people that can answer this sort of question because you've actually been in the A-team van as sort of such. Uh, does it drive well? Is it sort of comfortable? And what did the inside of it actually look like? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty uh, uh, spare. There wasn't much in it. Uh, I mean, uh, but what was the best part is that when when I was in it, I was in there with the A team. So you know, I didn't need any uh, any anything else. And, you know, it was like here we go. Okay, you know, it was, uh, it was just amazing. You know, when you're a kid, you play 
cops and robbers, you know, I played, we called it guns, you know, mm. just, you know, we had these little cap guns and that's what we're doing basically, you know, we're playing cops and robbers, just like kids, you know, it was just, you know, so I had, I had the best time doing it. And Iddy, in terms of guest stars that came in in sort of season five, obviously you were a recurring sort of star. Was there any sort of protocol for welcoming uh, guest stars that might come in, so big guest stars for one episode or sort of stuff? And did they meet you, the sort of regular cast? Did you go out for lunch or did you, after the show was um, shot and uh, finished rolling, did you have a sort of... Um, sort of tea or a celebratory drink to sort of finish off that sort of episode? Uh, no, just on the set, you know, we would enjoy our time on the set with each other. But when it was time to go home, we went home, and, you know, you go home and usually have a lot of script to go over and prepare for the next day. So it was very professional. We didn't, it wasn't much socializing, but I had such a ball on the set, you know, that was enough that we socialized enough there. Mm. I mean, George Papar was just wonderful with me. He kind of like took me under his wing as soon as he met me and welcomed me. And, uh, and I knew how I had been, I had done a lot of guest star mm. uh, spots on shows. So I knew what it was like to come in on a show that's already running and just be uh, the new guy. So I always, always, uh, I was always aware of new people and, and we would welcome them and approach them and make them feel comfortable because I knew, you know, that's really helpful when you when you show up on a set. It's like first day on a job, you know. Hmm. So, yeah, I would, uh, it, and we had such brilliant actors too that came through that that was wonderful. Yeah, and Itty, in terms of season one and season two, we had um, a recurring so far to female actress. We had Amy Allen in season one, and then obviously things didn't develop there there was a dispute and then uh marla heasley came in for season two was there ever a sort of possibility on season five as well i know yourself from robert vaughan were the two recurring actors was there ever a talk to bring in a sort of a female sort of recurring uh, actor for that sort of season as such or because they did it in the first two seasons did they feel that no we're not going to do that again well, I know they had, uh, um, Robert Vaughn had like an assistant, okay. a female assistant, uh, played by Judith Ledford, I okay. remember was the actress. So she was there basically the entire season as his sort of, you know, assistant would come in and bring him a file or some, uh, you know, something to having to do with the case. Or I remember her clearly. Mm -hmm. So, but she was brought in that year as well because of Robert Vaughn. And Eddie, in terms of um, the some of the episodes there in season five, I, in terms of the court case and the, the fire, the guns, uh, the, the supposed execution of the A team episode uh, as well, um, that sort of got sort of rave reviews at the time because it was like now the A team are sort of facing trial they have been sort of found guilty. And at the time, it sort of really brought in the sort of viewers to say, oh, what's going to happen sort of next? And obviously yourself and um, Murdoch had to sort of spring them and uh, try and sort of release them. But was there a good, awful, an awful lot of promotion of those two seasons, those two episodes really to kickstart that season five? Yeah, they, they did a, a fair amount of press. It was never like when the kickoff, you know, when it, the show first started, because it just got a really big uh, uh, kickoff and became number one from the very beginning. Mm. But uh, but that year, no, I think uh, they did their usual advertising, but they didn't overdo it because what I understood was that they all knew it was the the final season okay. before we even started. Uh, from what I what I heard was that you know the, the for, uh, at the end of the fourth season the ratings were so low that they were talking about canceling it, but uh, but because the show had held the network up it it, it held it it was the only uh, hit show it had for a while there, so they and they needed a, apparently exactly thirteen more episodes to make a hundred which that's okay. what, what you needed then to go into syndication. 
And the network, I think, as a favor to Stephen Canal, because he had been so good to the network, they they said, we'll give you 13 more episodes. And uh, But they also said, you kind of kind of change it up a little bit, mm. you know, spice it up somehow. And that's when they came up with the international angle and bringing Robert Vaughn and myself in. And Eddie, you mentioned you were brought in uh, in terms of that season five. Uh, were you a sort of a, a approach? Did you have to go through an audition sort of process or was it down to you and maybe one or two others to sort of land a role? Or did Steve, were you the man that Stephen Canal wanted from the off in terms of, listen, I want Eddie Velez to play this character, get him in there and you arrived and obviously you portrayed that role. Or did you have to go up against someone for that role? I did actually. Uh, I remember because uh, I I met with uh, Stephen Canal and they wanted me, but you always have to get approval from the the network. You always have to take that that last step and get in front of the network. They 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 have that right of approval. They have that that power and they they exercise it. So it's like no matter how big a producer, eventually when the producer gets their cast together, you have to get them through the network and the network will sign off on people. Now, may, they may sign off just by, you know, maybe by the career the actor has had, or they've worked with them before, or they just want, then they, or you have to audition, which I did, I had to go to NBC and audition. And there was another actor who was there, who had done, had done a lot of recurring, uh, uh, episodes of Hill Street Blues at the time, so he was doing well. And uh, so anyway, it was down to two people, and I went in and, and then came out with the job. So yeah, and Worked I suppose out. Eddie. Lastly, uh, before I let you go now, um, in terms of summarizing the whole sort of experience of the A Team, um, you came in in sort of uh, season five as such. Um, did you often feel to yourself, yeah, I love my time and I love the sort of getting that chance to be in the A team, but would you, did you like being in season five or would you look back in seasons and say, yeah, do you know what, if I was in season two or season three with 22 sort of episodes, I would have liked that even more. Are you sort of happy and content with the season that you were, did you found yourself in or is that something you, you have no control over? obviously yeah no i was very happy i was very happy the way it worked out i don't know why i don't remember exactly what but i remember just that when we got to about the 13th episode 13th episode i was like ready to move <laughs> i was ready to move on i was like okay i that was fun that was a lot of fun i got my fill i i exploded a lot of bombs i shot a lot of bullets and chased a lot of bad guys and had a lot of great fist fights with you know me what was great about also uh being on that show was that because the characters all the characters were so distinctive that whenever i had a scene with one of them it was different you know it's like whenever i was with uh you know face man We'd always be, he'd always be like flirting with girls. So we'd have scenes like that. Uh, when I was with the Murdoch, he's crazy. And we always doing crazy stunts and all kinds of silly things. With Mr. T, we're always doing fight scenes with people, knocking people out. I love that. And then, and then of course, with George Papar, we were always planning and the next uh, mission or plotting or, so uh, it was always, different with each guy and that was wonderful then of course when we got together then running around with the 18 and the 18 van that was the, the you know the, the cherry on top at the end of the day it's just wonderful you go home and you had a great, great day's work uh, Eddie, on that note, it's great talking to you again. It's actually great uh, seeing you in person. Uh, thanks for the conversation. We had a great conversation with you three years ago. We had a great conversation with you today. You're still looking as young, young as ever in terms of uh, appearing uh, on the 80s uh, and the 1980s. Anyway, uh, that's, that's for sure. Anyway, you haven't aged a bit. Uh, Eddie Velez, uh, an absolute okay. pleasure talking to you, reliving your memories of Frankie Santana. Really enjoyed the chat, Eddie. And... Uh, I think we've ran out of stuff to say. I think we've everything covered at this stage anyway, but cheers, mate, and take care and have a good one.
Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. You take care of yourself. Cheers, Eddie. Bye-bye.